Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to everyone to the Dunholm Camera Club channel. It's uh, great to see everybody. Well, not to see everybody, but to see everybody signing on. So I'm just going to click that button there so that you can see me for a minute. I know, I know you're all loving to see me this evening. So what have we got on the um, chat here? Um, well, the first this evening, the first this evening being uh, for Richard. He uh, he was in the house first and got all his chores done and uh, <laughs> and got in front of everybody else. Uh, who else? Graham H. Good evening, evening, Jill. Um, I hope you've got your laptop problem sorted out now jill so that's good um gail good evening dane good evening doreen vera neil uh chris peen i know is watching as well no doubt um janice from um the cooler climbs of scotland Good evening, Vera. Doreen, I've said that. Vera, excuse me. <coughs> Choking myself on my spit. <coughs> excuse me. Um, good evening, Vera. Who else have we got here? Um, I think I've said hello to Chris. Um, Vera Dory. Caroline, good evening to you this evening, and Tony, Jill, um, Alan, who else have I got? Jim, good evening, Jim, uh, Caroline Steele, and no doubt Dave as well. Yes, Dave as well, so welcome to you. Um, Viv, good evening, Viv, just popped up. Um, good evening, Bob. Don't uh, hope you've got your um, drink with you. Um, wouldn't want you to go thirsty during the night. <laughs> uh, good evening, Paul. Good evening, Paul. And Peter. Good evening, everybody. So we've got uh, virtually a full house, it's looking like. Um, we're up to 24 with still five minutes to go. So because we've got so many of you with us already, um, I haven't got any specific notices. Um, if um, Jill can think of anything that I should have said, if you can, <laughs> if you can drop it in the chat for us. Um, that would be appreciated. Oh, Bob's not thirsty tonight, so um, that's all right. Um, that would be appreciated, Jill, if you've got anything. The only thing, as a reminder, um, Saturday at Fat Cat Motocross Park um, should be plenty of action. It's not actual racing. It's a practice day, but um, you do still get them doing some... Uh, fairly good speeds etc from the young ones right through to the older ones so uh, that's good now if you intend on going and you haven't told me yet if you could uh, if you could just drop a note in the chat for us um, then that would be appreciated we can just see if anybody else is going i've had quite a few so um that's good um so that's all the notices saturday be there for 10 30. um they do actually start at 10 but usually it's very quiet in the first um sort of sessions they call them sessions um i used to be the official photographer at armthorpe for um about two years and we used to go very very regularly so um motocross is something that i absolutely love but uh, i was telling one or two people that unfortunately um unfortunately i haven't got a good 
spot on lens for the job at the moment so another one or two's popped up uh, diva good evening um michael good evening and Vivian's just let me know that she's going very good so welcome to everybody so right this evening we are looking at the images and i'm going to read the um the comments out from the judge the judge on this occasion was george malowanski I'm just going to check that because I think I've just told you wrong. So, um, but never mind. Um, uh, what you mentioned in email. You're... All right. Yeah. Jill's just dropped down a couple of things in a text, uh, in a message to me. Um, don't forget the president's challenge is near on needing to be put into your folder. So I believe next Thursday night is the last night. So make sure you get your images in. That's an open competition. So um, do make sure you get all of your top-notch pictures in there. Give me a challenge as well as me giving you a challenge. So and the other one is the monthly competition which i believe jill reminded me was food this um this month um right so george's name is george malin malinowski malinowski so george is the president at lincoln camera club and um he has done the uh, judging for us this evening. As you know, Jill always compiles all of these uh, images, puts them together, sends them off to the judge um, with a uh, listing of names, etc., etc. Then the judge jots down the um, information he wants to give us on the images critique and... Uh, then sends it back to us so as we all know um, everybody looks at images in different ways and the um, the differences between judges does as we all know tell because at the end of the day I can look at something that I possibly absolutely love and another judge could look at it and he doesn't like what I like and he judges it on the same merit but because it's possibly not quite what he likes it's scored down a little bit um, so you know we all have differences we all like different pictures so you know it um, it, it it can be um, um, a little bit different than what we all we, we all think so um nobody's saying they can't hear me so i'm presuming i'm okay on that one good evening ray um just a final one there that um that popped in very late there ray you're um you was at seven o'clock but uh but uh yes it was just on time that's all you need to be isn't it so Right, what we've got to do this evening, I am going to be shutting myself off the picture here. And um, you'll see the pictures come up. Um, I'm just about to put the first one up and get things sorted. So let me just get this full size. Let me get my sheet up. Whoops, let me just get that so that I can get rid of myself. So I want you to see all of the pictures. So that's got rid of me. I'll go back up to the top. So we do have this evening the final of the uh, potty competitions. Potty, of course, stands for Photographer of the Year for the new members and uh, the competition this time was natural history and if i'd looked on here i would have seen his name uh, it's there straight in front of me so let's without further ado make a start the first image is 
a snail. I don't know why I'm picking a piece of paper up because I'm reading it off the screen. The lighting is excellent with detail in the shadows and the texture on the shell has been brought out well. The main problem with the image is the depth of field. One of the eye stalks is totally out of focus and shows up as just a blur on the head of the snail. This spoils what is a competent image. Score 16. I'm just going to change something because I need to just see what's happening on here. So let me just move over to the side um, because now I can see what GH is put. Only kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, that's the first one. Right. So I'm going to get into the swing of it now, hopefully. So the first one scored 16. The second image is a wet morning. The hair in this image is sharp, well defined and detailed. The hair also has a very engaging expression on its face and the shining droplets in the grass give rise to the title. Monochrome treatment is unusual for natural history images and is used usually when the original Im image has had coloration problems. In this case, the treatment has given rise to a great deal of bland background that gives the impression that the hair and sharp foreground have been pasted into the image. Score 16. Number 3. And then I said, here the author has tried to take advantage of the expressions on the faces of the bears. The anthropomorphism is amusing, but in actual fact, the bears are probably finding the heat of the unnatural environment difficult. This image was taken in a safari park and not the wild. The author has not tried to hide the fact that the surroundings are not natural by defocusing the background, and that is to the author's credit. The bears are sharp, but the highlights are very bright, resulting in loss of detail, especially in the bear on the right. Score 15. Bear walking in snow. There can be no doubt that this bear is in its natural habitat. The exposure and colour balance have been handled extremely well. The detail in the bear's fur is outstanding. One can feel the wetness resulting from the melting snow. The snow thrown up by the bear's paws adds movement to the image. The determined look on the bear's face increases the appeal of the image. This one's been held back. Uh, number five, be close to me. The biggest problem encountered, um, I was just thinking, sorry to stop there, I was just thinking, I'm not saying who the authors are, so to start at the top, the snail was Jan's up in Scotland, a wet morning the hair was Bob's, and then I said was Caroline Oldham's, Bear walking in the snow was Jim's, and we now be close to me, which is Steve's. The biggest problem encountered in macro photography is getting a moving subject in focus. This becomes especially difficult when one gets really close in. Once focus has been achieved, there is the added problem of depth of field. In this case, I would suggest that the author has got in too close and thus made it impossible to get anything in focus. Problems have been compounded by the heavy areas of burnout uh, in the flower on which the bee is resting. The choice of a witty title does nothing to improve the image. Score 13. Just move up a minute. Blackbird and Slug. This one is Gales. The rule in nature photography and portraiture is 
If the head is visible, focus on the eyes. In this case, the eye is not in focus. The sharpest part of the bird is the wing. Normally, having the background out of focus would be the requisite. However, the author has brought our attention to the fact that there is a slug in the image. This cannot be clearly made out and without the author bringing in ex existence of, to the viewer's notice, one could mistake the light coloured blob for a vegetable lying on the ground. Maybe that is what it is and the blackbird has the last remains of the slug in its beak. Score 14. Butterfly. This is Jans. This is a difficult macro shot to do well. Achieving a good depth of field is usually the main task that the author has to battle with. It is relatively easy if all parts of the subject are in the same plane. But in this case, the butterfly is positioned side on. With that in mind, the author has decided not to limit the depth of field, but has gone the whole hog of getting maximum sharpness. This, along with the backlighting on the butterfly's wing, has resulted in a crisp image where every facet is in focus. The fact that the background is also in focus does not degrade the image, and in fact, the arrangement of the foliage enhances the competition. That image has been held back. Clematis. Oh, no, sorry, gone one too much. Chalk Hill Blue Butterfly. And this is Graham Halliday's. In this image, the author has gone for the out-of-focus background approach, giving an unob unobtrusive backdrop. Most of the butterfly is sharp, except for the bottom section of wing, which is very soft on the edge. This is a case of the butterfly not being in exactly the right position to achieve full sharpness at the depth of field provided by the lens aperture being used. The detail in the body and head of the butterfly is excellent. 17. Clematis, the president. This is Michael Hughes. This is an unusual treatment of the botonic subject. The author has decided to go for a pictorial approach as opposed to a record, which is the case with most natural images. The letterbox frame adds to the pictorial aspect. The fact that the depth of field in this case is not great does not degrade the image. The flower has been photographed from an unusual angle with the out of focus foreground petal leading to the pin sharp center. I give full credit to the author for trying something different. 17. Come into my parlor, Paul Walker. Although the author has managed to get the back of the spider in focus, the depth of field selected has not allowed much else to be sharp. The action is there, but unfortunately the image is not quite there technically. 14. Common Blue Damselfly. Vera Holmes. And I'm pleased that um, quite a few of you have gone to the um, effort of doing the um, Latin names as well. That's very good because in the very top competitions, it would be expected that you look up and put the Latin names as well. So, right, come on, boo, damselfly. A macro shot that has got it right. The damselfly itself is stunningly sharp and one can count the hairs on the insect's back. The wings, which are usually a problem, are sharp and perfectly detailed. Depth of field has not been lost on the plant on which the insect is perched and yet the author has managed to have the background suitably faded out. The only downside is a bit of flat lighting. 
this image has been held back. Common Blue, Martin Chambers. This is another perfectly sharp image. The only criticism that can be made is the fact that the butterfly is very small in the frame. The only reason for this that comes to mind is that, and this is just a guess, guess, the picture was taken with a long lens and not macro. The author has cropped the image but did not want, uh, did not dare go further in case of pixelation set in. This is my theory, but regardless, if, sorry. This is my theory, but regardless if it is right or not, it is technically a very good image. 17. Common Damselflies, Michael Hughes. This, and I do apologise, although <laughs> what I said about the Latin names, as I say, quite a few people have got Latin names on them, but I can't read them out. Uh, but thank you for once again for putting them there. Common damselflies. This is the standard heart-shaped pose of mating damselflies um, that have been captured by legions of nature photographers. Having said that, it is not an image that has been easy to capture well. The author has produced a beautifully sharp image and an arrangement that gives a very pleasing composition. This one also has been held back right next one common lizard one these have only been named one and two because there was title the same so jill usually puts a one and a two on them so this one is doreen in this image one gets the impression that the lizard is ready to jump out of the picture this is because the head and the foreleg of the lizard are so sharp and detailed as it recedes, the body and tail go, sorry, body and tail go gradually out of focus, but this is no deterrent to the image. This works very well, the viewer's eye starting in the bottom left corner follows the tail to the body, which gradually increases in sharpness culminating in the astounding sharpness of the lizard's head. This is an, a, an impressive image, and that one's held back as well. Um, common lizard. Gale. The lizard in this image, though sharp throughout, does not have any dramatic impact. The main problem is the grass that is intruding into the dominate and dominating the image. The foreground grass is especially obtrusive. Normally the area would be cleared of such obstacles, but it, but it is understood that the author did not have the time or opportunity to do so before the subject of the image rapidly disappeared. 15. Common Lizard Vera Holmes. The first thing to be commented on is the sharpness of the creature throughout. There is a loss of sharpness in the section of the tail situated at the right of the image, but that is not detrimental to the image as a whole. The detail in the body of the lizard is outstanding, as it is the detail in the tail that shows the articulation of the scales to full effect. The only negative comment to be made about the image is the stalk and dark blob above the lizard's head. This could be cloned out under normal circumstances and is permissible under PAGB rules. Now, we, we aren't part of PAGB, so, but apparently not in the rules of your competition. A good image. That one is held back as well. Right, Common Poppy, and this is Graham Halliday's. Although the quality of this image is adequate, it needs to be sharp throughout to be outstanding. The petals that curl up towards the viewer gradually soften and the flower 
loses definition. The flower is undoubtedly recognisable as a poppy, but from the point of view of the viewer, the angle of the shot does not give the best impression of the flower. 15. Common reed bunting. This is Bob's. This image gives the viewer a rather strange impression. The bird itself looks very two-dimensional and is surrounded by what looks like texture overlay. These anomalies can be explained, and I hope I'm right, by the fact that a very long lens was used in the taking of the shot. The bird was perched in a blossom-filled tree and the overlay effect was created by the blossom filled branches in the foreground moving about. This would also account for the green coloration in the bird's tail. The sharpness and detail captured in this bird cannot be faulted. 16. Coot Arm Blue Water, Jill Pardo. The coot as is its reflection is sharp and well defined in detail in the white foreground and beak has been captured well although the author has tried to emphasize the blue water it could be argued that there is far too much distracting background a closer crop removing the foliage reflections would help to improve the image 16 Cormorant in Flight by some joker called Graham Duncan. Right, that's me. Um, to get this sharpness and detail in a flying bird is outstanding. The big letdown is that the shot was taken against a horrible grey sky and as a result the background is completely blank giving no reflection, sorry, giving no reference to the location of the bird whatsoever. From just looking at the image, one could easily assume that it was a stuffed bird. <laughs> because of the quality captured in the bird, the image gets a fairly high mark, but this would be much higher with a better background. 17. God, you have to laugh at these judges, don't you? It's only a fun competition, folks. Cormorant Portrait. And this is Jim's. This is a very detailed portrait. The outstanding feature is the emerald eye that looks like a jewel set in the surrounding yellow. The subdued background has some features that suggest water. A very good image. And that one has been held back. 14 Gannets. This is one of my own again. Uh, Cutting gannets, this is an image that is seen very often, but that is not surprising since the crossing of the bills is the usual feature of gannets courtship. The image itself cannot be faulted technically. And that one's held back. Uh, curlew. Let me just find my line. Curlew, that's Jill Guests. Although the image in general is very sharp and detailed, the curlew, the subject of the image, commands a very small portion of the picture. The scene is about the rocky shoreline and the different states of the water rather than the bird. 16. Diving Gull. This is Chris Peen's. As with the previous image, there is far too much background and in this case the background adds nothing to the image. A closer crop would help to make the image more dramatic and also help the viewer to concentrate on the bird itself. 16. Uh, where am I? Erasian Otter going for a dip. Jill Pardo. 
This is again a very busy image where the subject has taken second place. Although the scene is well photographed, the problem um, lost my place. Well photographed. The problem is the angle of view. It is understood that in any wildlife photography scenario, the photographer has little control over what the subject will do. However, a wrong angle does not help the image. In this case, the bright water dominates and constantly takes the eye away from the otter itself. The otter is small in the frame. A tighter crop would help the image if this did not compromise the quality of the image. Cloning out of the white disc in the water would also help. Score 16. Family. Family is Caroline Oldham. Strictly speaking, nature images should not be anthropomorphized. I think that means the title. Anthropomorphized. However, in this case, one cannot avoid doing so. We can identify with the baboon mother's gathered together each with her baby a high quality image with plenty of action much of it still to be played out image held back Filey Bay Gull Paul Walker this is what I would call a record shot of a gull standing on a rock technically the image is good with all of the important areas sharp and detailed especially the eye area the bird is doing what it usually does when not attacking holiday makers with bags of chips and that is not much a gummy good image in, t in <laughs> i'll start again sorry a good image though all to be score 16 sorry getting myself all raffled up there Gannett at Bempton Cliffs. This is Viv's. As with the previous image, it is a good record shot of this bird. It is technically good, but is almost identical with many images that crop up all the time. A good image, but not outstanding. Score 16. Grasshopper, Doreen. This is a macro that is so nearly right. However, most of the grasshopper is soft and the grass stalk that crosses the insect in the foreground is sharp. The eye is drawn to the sharpest regions and those are the ones that the author is not interested in. The bright out of focus grass stalk in the background does not help the composition either. 15. Right. Grey Heron. And Grey Heron is by Alan Crossland. The author of this image has taken it through waving grass and this has created a misty effect at the bottom of the bird. This is a pity since the texture and detail in the plumage is very good. The misting, the misting effect has degraded the image somewhat. The lighting is good but not quite even and a little darkening in the head area would be beneficial. Score 15. Gull on Brayford. Steve Howell. The gull unfortunately is not the most interesting part of this image. It is rather dark and lacking in detail. It also appears to have only one leg. The, the interesting part of the image is the bright frozen splash in the water. It begs the question, is it from where the bird took off or is it where it pooped? The story is a strong point of this image. Score 14. Hermit Crab. 
And I've lost my line. Hermit Crab. Mark Richardson. <coughs> Excuse me all. There is not a sharp feature anywhere in this image. The This may be because it was taken through water or if an if if in an aquarium through glass that was not perfectly clean. Regardless, it should have been possible to get a sharp image since these creatures are not likely to run away. The framing is also not quite right since the crab has had one of its feelers cut off at the bottom of the image. Score 13. Nearly didn't move my picture on then. House Spider. House Spider Jim. This is very well taken macro image. The depth of field is excellent with only a very small portion of one leg soft. The only factor spoiling the image is the fact that it is very closely cropped. There is no border for the spider to stand in. And the leg on the right has been cut off. Moving back a little would have improved the image. 16 points. Hoverflies mating. Doreen. It is not often that one gets the chance to photograph this scene, let alone get it in such stunning, stunning detail. The technical aptitude that the author has displayed is obtaining this macro shot is outstanding. Excellent. Image held back. Hoverfly Delight. Hoverfly Delight. Steve Howell. This is another image that proves that macro photography is not as easy as seen. Nowhere in the image is unfortunately totally in focus. Um, I'll start again. Nowhere an image is in total foliage. And the flower is soft as well. Sorry, got myself totally wrapped up there. 13. Jackdaw. This is one of mine. The detail and clarity of this image is excellent. The background is nicely faded out with just a hint of the branches behind the bird to add context. Because the author has cho chosen to keep the background branch, much of the right of the image has become redundant and can be safely cropped off without compromising the composition of the image. The image is held back. Uh, just a sparrow, Paul Walker. This once very common bird would not, at one time, be considered a desirable photographic subject. Now times have changed. The author has captured it in a cheeky pose. This is a good shot of the sparrow. There are a couple of comments that could be made about the technical aspects of the image. The head of the bird is very slightly out of focus and the bottom half of the image could do with just darkening down a little. 16. Um, keeping watch. This is Caroline Oldham's. This is an image taken in a safari park. Sorry, I'll start again. This is an image taken in a safari park. I don't think dandelions and nettles grow in the Maasai Mara. The lion has been well photographed and the focus, depth of field and exposure of the image are good. There is a problem with the composition, however. Having the lion situated in the top left corner implies that it is not really an important feature of the image. The rock in the bottom right tends to dominate. A tighter crop would concentrate on the lion. Score 15. Large white male vindas natri dirum 
That was a mouthful for me. Oh, that was... Sorry, it's not in... He hasn't put it in um, brackets. It's large white male. Um, so, consequently, the Vindas Naturadiarian is the Latin. The stark contrast of the white of the butterfly against the dark background should work favourably for the author. However, this is not the case here. The main problem is that the white wings are burnt out in places with the consequent, consequent loss of detail. The butterfly itself is also not quite in focus. Generally, the composition is a good one, though. Score 15. Oh, sorry, I didn't tell you who that was. That was Michael Hughes. Lima lost my finger Lima on guard Crispine it's a lot easier actually when you're looking at an image and critiquing it yourself because uh, tr tr reading other people uh, other people's writing it's all it's not quite the same as possibly what you would write yourself so it does um lend itself to you reading it and all of a sudden you want to add your own little bits on it so excuse me in a place of two so lemur on guard the lemur is looking up at something but we do do not get to see what it is there is just a dark space the expanse of darkness is unnecessary and adds nothing to the composition of the image a section can be easily cut off the top of the image. The lima itself is well detailed, but a little dark. Brightening the image would make it a, a little less sombre. 16, sorry, 16. Locust basking in the morning sun. The locust is well in focus except for its head, which is very slightly soft. The only downside to this image is the shadow from the locust's leg crossing its head. Otherwise, the lighting is very good. 16. Male kestrel with mouse. Just looking who's it is. Martins. The thing that grabs one's attention initially is not the kestrel or the mouse, but the barbed wire. It is a distracting element in the image and totally unnecessary. By cropping the image and removing the wire, emphasis would be transferred to the kestrel, making a much stronger image. The detail in the kestrel is very good. And the image is also sharp enough to make out the detail in the mouse. 16. It won't work. There we go. Marbled whites on greater napweed. Caroline Steele. The composition of this image is perfect, but the butterflies are not as sharp as they could be. This is not because the image itself is out of focus, but because it is cropped. It is a cropped section. My guess could be wrong. Of as much larger image and is at the point where pixelation is cutting in. A very pleasant image that could have been much better. 16. Uh, meadow brown on plant. Crispine. Very good try. Nothing is quite in focus and there is a great deal of plant and background. I have said previous, previously that insect photography is not easy but practice will make perfect. 13. More hen. Sorry, folks, just turning my sheet. More hen. Uh, this is Caroline Steele. 
Although there is plenty of detail in the background, the so I'll start again. Although there is plenty of detail in the background, the body of the bird is very blotchy, and if the noise reduction has been overcompensated, this has degre degraded a well composed image. 15. Mother and child take a stroll. Mark Richardson. This is probably a natural habitat image since I don't think the bird on the hippo's back and the egret are indigenous to the Yorkshire Wildlife Park. The composition of the image is just right with the two birds adding interest to the scene on the to the scene. On the downside, the hippo's head and the infant are not as sharp as they possibly could be and the egret is very bright to the point of burnout. An overall lowering of brightness may improve the image. 16. Excuse me folks, just having a quick slurp. <coughs> Mute swans and cygnets. This one has done well for so many of it. This one has done well for so many of its signets to have survived. The image itself is quite a unique record, and the author is lucky to have been able to capture it. The composition of the image is good, but a little more clarity would have boosted its appeal. 16. Norfolk Reed Seedhead. Sorry, that last mute swan was Caroline Steele's. Norfolk Reed Seedhead, Jill Pardo. This is not a subject that many people would think of tackling, but it is nature. The image is a pleasing composition, although the subject is maybe not the most exciting. Well done for producing something different. 16. <clears throat> Northern Lapwing, Jill Guest. The bird has a surprised look. <laughs> That's quite good, isn't it? Have you ever seen a bird with a surprised look on its face? The bird has a surprised look about it and is quite comical. The framing of the image produces a rather awkward composition. The image is very tight at the top and bottom, but very wide at the sides. If, all, if at all possible, cropping the sides but leaving enough for the bird to march into and at the same time giving more headroom could have improved the image. 16. Northern Lights, and this is Danes. This is not an easy photo to take. Firstly, it was probably a long exposure taken in, a very, dark, in very dark conditions. I am assuming that a tripod was used, but even so, the trees and buildings in the distance are not in focus. It is agreed that the image is all about the colours in the sky but the ground level elements need to be in focus for the image to have credence. The camera was more than likely manually focused and this shows that just setting to infinity is not always the right thing to do. 15. Otter Cooling off. Alan Crossland. Um, this, this is an outstanding high quality image. Well seen and composed. And that one's held back. Uh, 
Right, red damselfly. Get my finger on the right line. Martin Chambers. The damselfly is sharp and detailed throughout. The lighting is good, giving rise to a very good to very good coloration. The only niggle is that the end of the tail is obscured by the leaf. There is maybe too much blank green background on the left of the image but these are only small points. 17. Red grouse in bell heather. Bob. This is one of Bob's. Um, in this image there appears to be a vast amount of heather and not much grouse. The first reaction would be to crop the image down to concentrate more on the grouse. However, inspection shows that there is a blotchy effect on the grouse itself and that could indicate that this image is part of a much larger one and any further cropping would result in pixelation. This is a pleasant image but has its failings. 15. <coughs> Rock Formation, Yorkshire Coast. This is one of Viv's. Rock Formation, Yorkshire Coast. Yes, rocks are part of nature, although not everyone finds them exciting. I like this image for its pictorial value. The image has an abstract feel to it, and at the same time could be mistaken as being a satellite image of the ground. The rock has, of course, been photographed from fairly close, uh, sorry, from fairly close proximity, and the stones are tiny pebbles. Increasing the contrast and or saturation could enhance the image further. 16. Salsify seed head, Graham Halliday. The seed head itself is very sharp and detailed, but unfortunately it is fighting with the background, especially the plants at the bottom of the image. Without these, it would have the potential of being an outstanding image. Score 16. Seabird, common shag perched on rock. This is Alan Crossland's. Although sharp and detailed, this image is rather surreal. I'm sure that the coloration of the plumage should be black, but the bird in this image is greeny blue. The background is a very saturated blue. The general saturation and especially the blue should be reduced to give a more natural look to the image. 16. Just a point there. When, I, when I'm reading the comment and there's a short pause, it's because I've stopped looking at the other screen where I'm reading it from and I'm looking at the image just to see what I think. <laughs> so, hence the reason if I go although sharp and detailed this image is blah 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 and i stop it's because i've just looked at the image so uh, now you know why uh, score 16 if i haven't already said so snow bunting uh, this is jill guests handling the white in a snow scene is a difficult task. The problem in this image has been compounded by trying to photograph a bird with white plumage against the white of the snow. The author of this image has failed in the task. 
the very small bird and the snow have blended in several areas and there are areas of burnout throughout the image. The composition of the image is generally good but that is not quite enough to save it. 15. Solitary tree clinging to the hillside. This is one of Dane's. The question begs to be asked, at what point does an image cease to be nature and becomes landscape? I can see the tree and that is nature. There is a hillside covered in grass. However, I don't think there is enough detail of either to qualify as a nature image. As an image it is reasonable enough but possibly has not been entered into the correct category. Score 12. Uh, the small white butterfly this is Viv's. Um, as a pictorial composition, this image is very attractive. However, it is entered into a nature competi competition in which attractiveness is not the main concern. The butterfly needs to be in focus and unfortunately in this case it is not and that is a shame. 15. Toadstool. And this is one of Gale's. The author has managed to get the exposure and colour right. However, much of the toadstool is not quiet in focus. The areas that are in focus are the dead leaf on the toadstool and the grasses that surround it with a bit more depth of field this image would be right. 15. Two snails. This is Jan's. The, let me just move my cursor because it's over the words. The question that beds, the, oh, <laughs> start again. The question that begs the asking is, were the snails placed in that position or were they actually strolling side by side? If it is the former then I would say that the author should have placed them closer together. If the latter then it was a fortunate photographic opportunity. The lighting is just right but unfortunately the shells of both snails are not quiet in focus. There is also a strange anomaly above the shell of the smaller snail. Is it a white line which does not appear to be attached to the snail shell? Just looking at it myself and I think it's a bit of hair or something. Something like that. So, um, don't know. As I said right at the very beginning... Different people look at different things differently. A lot of difference and differently there. Uh, score on that one was 15. Just a couple to go and then we'll break for a little while. Um, this is a Wasp by Dane. It isn't because I haven't put it up. There we go. Wasp by Dane. Uh, this is another case where the author has possibly got in just a little bit too close and not been able to get a proper focus on the subject. Macro is very difficult to get right, especially at very close quarters. 13. And the final one is Wolf Spider. Oh, he looks angry, doesn't he? <coughs> uh, sorry, this one is Vera's. 
and I can put my sheet down now because my elbows is my elbows hurting <laughs> this is an image in which it is very difficult to figure out what is going on mainly because of the numerous numerous areas of burnout on the image the head of the spider is in focus but looks as if it is wearing a very bright white cap separation of the spider and plant is difficult to differentiate although it was a good try at macro the image possibly did not quite reach the desired effect score 14 well folks my own opinion is that um, you've all done very well and it's not for one judge to criticize another judge's comments at all and i wouldn't do so and i would say once again that everybody is different we all see different things i put that image i remember last year i think it was whenever it was very beginning of the year no it was very beginning of this year of a couple in an old train and um I, as a judge, hadn't even seen a half of a sign on the side of the train. And the judge who judged it did. So, you know, we all pick out different things and we all see different things. But what I would say is that um, you've all done very well this evening to get your images in. We've had a very difficult year in being able to get out there in the early part of the year when all of these uh, nature type things um, natural history um, should i've just seen what steve said i like the eye of the spider should have typed eyes <laughs> um, yes the um, the conditions for us weren't really good to get out there and give ourselves plenty of time to um, to get some uh, uh, extra images so well done to everybody for entering and uh, great to see so many good images we'll be back after the break um, we'll go through to quarter past still um, i'll be back on at 10 past so i shall catch you all then and we'll look at the other images that have been held back and um, you've heard all of the critique now there's no more critique to go i'll just say a bit about these others that um, um, just to give a bit of an explanation so we shall see you all at ten past eight all the best to you all until then <laughs>